you today and I see that you are already very numerous joining us from the comfort of your sofa. Both Peter de Kurs and myself are very happy to be with you today and we're going to give you two many lecture, mini lectures. If I can go back to my previous slide. First I'm going to talk, then Peter will talk and then we will answer your questions. We're going to talk about our research and the research that is done in our faculty. So please focus your questions on what we mention in our lectures. If you have more questions about the program itself, please go to the information market, market and you can probably see somewhere here or here a QR code that you can scan to ask more questions about the program itself. My name is Marie Soresi. I am French, as you can hear, and I am a professor here at Leiden University, and I am a professor of what is called hominin diversity archaeology. So I work on previous forms of humans who happen to be here in Europe, elsewhere in the world, before our direct ancestors came. And what I'm going to try to convince you and to show you with this small presentation is that Leiden archaeologists are at the cutting edge of humanities and natural sciences. First, I want to go through the different, some of the reasons why archaeology is so powerful. First, archaeology fascinates. One of the discoveries I made is the one of tools made out of bone manufactured by Neanderthals. Those tools were made out of a rib of bovid and they were used to work hide. They were invented 50,000 years ago. But they are still in use today. Hermes in Paris is manufacturing leather purse using a tool that was invented 50,000 years ago by a species different from us, by the Neanderthals. This is fascinating. And of course, when there is a exhibition about Neanderthals, like the one which was in Paris last year, there are thousands of visitors every single day. Archaeology is very powerful also because it is fun, it is adventure. And here a picture of one of my team when doing field work. Here on the field in the lab and at the site. Archaeology is also fun because see here one of our professor, David Fontaine, presenting his last book to the ex, to the former queen of the Netherlands. At the Faculty of Archaeology in Leiden, we are excavating all around the world. You see here a map. And of course, we are excavating in the Netherlands. But if you don't like the Netherlands and you would like to excavate in a more exotic place, well, you can go to the Caribbean. But if you want some weather that is more dry, then you can also go to the desert in the Near East or in Central Asia. You can also go to Jordan. You can also go to the United States or to South Africa. We excavate in all of those places. Archaeology is also very powerful because it puts us into perspective. For instance, some of us are excavating water management system from the Roman period in Jordan. And actually figuring out that some of the water, some of those water management systems 
are in some ways better than some of the systems we are using today. One of our professors is working on the extension of the Roman Empire and trying to figure out how this Roman Empire used to be so big, but at the same time remained united. How could it be that before the advent of the internet, before the advent of the telephone and of the telegraph, the Roman power was able to maintain an empire over a so large area? And one of the things I show with my own research is that Neanderthals, more than 40,000 years ago, were actually as smart as us today. They interbred with our ancestors and they gave us DNA. So for instance, the part of our immune system is due to Neanderthals. Archaeology is also powerful because it shows a past that hurts. For instance, take Mexico City. The center of Mexico City, there is this beautiful cathedral. And a few years ago, a group excavated underneath it. What did they find? They find a temple from the Aztecs buried under the cathedral. So archaeology has the power to show what's hidden. And when it comes to the archaeology of North America, for instance, or Central America, we have here in Leiden a professor who is rewriting the history of the Caribbean and of Central America. So archaeology confronts us by showing us the dark side of Western history. And it helps also in the genius people who are often powerless minor minority today to rewrite their history. Okay, maybe you just want to work in the lab and that's it. So I'm going to give you a few examples coming from my own research and research that I did with my students. Here is one example related to fire production. We figure out that some of those small rocks used by Neanderthals a long time ago, if you reduce them into powder and you use them where you uh, start a fire, then it's much easier to start a fire. So basically what we have found is the first fire starter. Another example is how you can use proteins, ancient proteins that are preserved to identify bones. Recently with one of my students, we showed that some of those bone, bone points found on the shores of the Netherlands were actually made out of human bone. So human bones were used to manufacture weapons that then were used to kill red deer. This is during the Mesolithic, circa eight, 9,000 years ago in the Netherlands. And the last example is this app that one of my students wrote to reconstruct what was previously excavated at a site. At the bottom of the slide, what you can see is one of the sites I recently excavated. And of course, because it has been excavated before, we cannot no more see what was excavated and where. So using a tablet, if you are at the site, what you can actually do is, that, is look at the site, turn around, and then the tablet is showing you both the site, but also the artifacts that were excavated before all of those points of colors on the slide. So those are just a few examples of the kind of applied science that we have the privilege to do here in Leiden. So archaeology 
is a rainbow discipline and is even more a rainbow discipline here in Leiden. And because of that, what we aim to do is to give you a myriad of skills. Of course, we will train you to think critically and to identify patterns. But because you would do archaeology in Leiden, what you're going to learn also is A, to communicate clearly, to deal with the unfamiliarity, to team up, to lead projects, and to work with multidisciplinary projects with large amount of data and with a diversity of approaches and techniques. So I hope I've shown you that Leiden archaeologists are and will be in the future at the cutting edge of humanities and natural sciences. I'm going to give the floor to Professor Peter Teckers, who is going to take you a little bit more into details about heritage and society and how it's done here at the Faculty of Archaeology in Leiden. Professor Peter Teckers, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, I also would like to start by saying, well, very nice that you join us for this talk um, and that um, we can talk now a bit about the MA track, Heritage and Society. Um, it's already very clear from what uh, Marie said that uh, archaeology is, of course, about the past, but not only about the past. Archaeology is about much more than that. It's also about how people nowadays react on uh, objects, on sites, on monuments, on all kinds of things that we think are important, things that we call heritage. And heritage is actually, uh, there are many definitions and I won't go into detail, but um, heritage, you could define it as things that we find important enough to guard, to keep for more than one generation sometimes for two generations, sometimes for ten de uh, generations, things that we think should not be uh, thrown away, actually things that we find important. And I'm going to talk to you about um, heritage as something that has multiple sides, multiple uh, interpretations can be used to, to study heritage. There's... Um, Let's say some years ago, there was the idea that heritage, uh, beautiful objects, art, whatever you call it, is meant to be aesthetically enjoyed or you can enjoy it for educational purposes. Very often, you see that also in the literature, people say uh, uh, when you go to a museum, you go to see beautiful things or you go to educate yourself, to learn things. It's now clear from the research of the last few decades that it is much more than that. Uh, one of the things, and I mention it here in the slide, one of the things is that heritage can also be very impressive. We say in scientific terms, it has an agency, it has an effect on people, even if you don't know exactly what it is, even if you don't read the text, even if you're not sensitive for the aesthetic beauty of an object, you can still be very impressed by it. You can even be shocked by it. I will give you some examples later on. So that has nothing to do with educational purposes. It's a kind of effect that objects have on people. So it can be just something that you cannot define in words, something that makes you feel good or makes you feel bad or something like that. But heritage also very much is related to political issues. That's also something that was often denied in the past. Uh, when I started my uh, museum work many years ago, before I was at the universities, I worked in, in, in uh, museums in Leiden. And one of the first things I heard many years ago was, you always have to think about the fact that museums are neutral. Museums don't intervene in political issues. Nowadays, you really can't say that anymore. Heritage and museums and monuments and sites are always also political statements, or in favor of a state, or in favor of the elite, or in favor of whatever group. 
there's always a political angle to heritage. So that neutral image of heritage we should throw overboard and that should be replaced by another image. And that's actually the last point I want to show in this first slide, that is that very often nowadays, more than before, heritage is, um, can also be seen as a kind of uh, contested heritage. There are many different groups that claim property or that claim ownership, whether it's legal ownership or emotional ownership. Those are two different things that are not always the same. But uh, the legal status of an object or of a monument or of, or of a statue can be very clear. In, in a national museum, the collection is owned legally by the nation state, by the national state. But emotional property is something completely different. People who see themselves as the original owner of an object, people who live in Indonesia or in Africa or in South America or other European countries, they may say, well, that object is in a European uh, museum, but why? Why can't we get it back to show it in our own museum or in the village square of the place where, where we live? Those kind of issues are more and more important for the heritage world. I would like to give you some examples of how you can look at heritage and what kind of work we are doing here in Leiden, uh, not only of the, in the Faculty of Archaeology, but in many other... We work very close together with the fa Faculty of Law. It's also important to understand the legal rules. We work close together with the Faculty of Humanities. Uh, my appointment is partly also in the Faculty of U Humanities and in the Faculty of the Social Sciences. And as Marie said already, there's a lot of interest in working together with the exact science scientists, the laboratories of the university, not only in, um, in Leiden, but also in the University of Delft. Heritage still has something of, um, it, it has to be something, something material, something that you can relate to. The French scholar Pierre Nor Nora called it uh, lieu de mémoire, a place of memory, a, pl a place where your memory is stim stimulated. You have to have a, a physical place where you can relate to heritage. That's not always the case, but let me just not discuss all the details. Uh, these physical places can be anything. Uh, sometimes spectacular monuments. This is a monument for the rev revolution in France. In, this is in Bordeaux, but every French village or town has a monument relating to the French revolution. Those monuments were not made just after the revolution, they were usually made a hundred years later to create a history, to create a common history in favor of the, the idea of the nation state. So this is one of those lieux de mémoire, to remember the people, this is, this is important in our history, this is where we have to be proud of or that something we always have to remember. It can also be an archaeological site. Uh, this is a site in Tun uh, Tunisia, a uh, bit central east Tunisia. Uh, at the background, you see the Med uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, Sea. Uh, this is the site Kek 1 that has been excavated um, some years ago. Uh, it's a uh, Punic site uh, from the, the Punic culture and uh, was probably destroyed by the Romans during the Second Punic War and was rediscovered actually uh, many years later. This site has been excavated, partly restored and needs, let's say, outreach. There needs, there needs to be more information towards the local population, towards the, the tourists that pass. Uh, they have a mu museum, but it's a very small mu museum. The museum needs to be renovated, and that's the kind of work we also do in the Heritage and Society Department. Um, this is, for instance, a site where for the next two years we will work together with the local archaeologists, together with the local population. We will give museum courses, we will give site management courses uh, to revitalize this very fascinating site. It must have been a, th a, th a th thriving a uh, trade city uh, in the ancient past, and it really needs to be much more uh, known, not only uh, for the local population, but also for uh, foreign tourists 
who pass. And that shows already how important heritage is for the present day, for economic purposes, for feelings of identity, etc., etc. Another example of a lieu de mémoire that is uh, fascinating is the Singasari Temple in East Java, the, uh, the Indonesian island Java, where this is a 13th century temple where uh, that was actually in a very bad shape when it was rediscovered in the 19th century by uh, the Dutch col colonial officers. And uh, it has been restored now. And this Singasari Temple is an image of an important temple of an empire one of the last empires that existed in Indonesia before the Europeans came. So for the European state, for the, Euro for the uh, Indonesian state, sorry, uh, this temple is a, a symbol of the enormous power of Indonesia before it became the Dutch East Indies, before it became uh, a col colony of the Netherlands. So these are important sites that are, that are now restored and attract a, a lot of tourists, mainly Indonesian tourists. It's not, not only European tourists uh, or Americans, or it's mainly uh, uh, European tourists, although some of the collection that was found there in the surroundings of the temple, like this Ganesha statue, is in a museum in Leiden. So the objects and the site were often separated. I'll come back to this later. Museums can also be lieu de mémoire, can also be places, where, places of memory, places where you remember things, where a national history is created. Uh, the National Museum in Amsterdam, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, is a place that is not only an art museum, but also has a large department of national Dutch history, where uh, Dutch history is shown to the people, to the Dutch people, but also to, to the tourists. And nowadays, more and more also the critical aspect of Dutch history, uh, where uh, co colonial times used to be presented as a kind of glorious past, is now, of course, presented in a very different manner, in a, uh, as a period in which a lot of violence was used to suppress people. And uh, that's also more and more uh, part of heritage studies, the, 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 the colonial period and uh, the urge of people from the former colonies to demand their objects back. That's also something we will address in the MA track. Here you see the internal, the Greek department of the National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden. And uh, here you see also a photograph from the 1930s of the Museum of Antiquities where you see that the educational aspect is uh, very, very important. It still is in the museums. Of course, there are many school children visiting the museums in Leiden, but ac actually everywhere in the world. Museums clearly have an ed educational purpose. Um, and you see that here in the 1930s already. Um, but of course, a function of a museum is more than that. It's also, uh, as I said, to impress people, to show the agency of the object. When people enter the National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden for the first time, they, all, they always say, what's this Egyptian temple doing here? You see an enormous uh, real life-size Egyptian temple. And there are immediately all kinds of discussions of what, he, what is he doing here? Was it stolen? Was it a gift, etc., etc. So it, it, it evokes emotions. It, it's something that's very much into what people are thinking or uh, thinking about nowadays. On a more theoretical level, and I would like to stress that, we are not only dealing with uh, colonial issues or with uh, restitution issues, in inclusivity, diversity, etc. We are also dealing with more theoretical issues because in all these sensitive issues, sensitive political issues, there are, um, there's an underlayer of what I always call the object-subject entanglement. People feel somehow attracted to objects and objects make us react in a certain way. We destroy them or we cherish them, we put them in a showcase with a spotlight on it or we put them in the storerooms because we think they're not that important. Objects do something with us. And that more theoretical, more philosophical approach is clearly 
present in what we do in heritage and uh, museums. That's more the museum studies angle, actually. There's always this strong attachment of us human beings, the subjects, and the objects. Part of our identity is shaped by relating to objects. And that's not only for us as a person, but also for us as part of a group, or part of a nation state, or part of Europe, or part of the, the global world. Objects play a crucial role in, this, uh, in creating these type of identities. Someone who knew that very well was, of course, uh, Napoleon. He was not the only one, but uh, Napoleon Bonaparte used objects enormously to enhance his status, to create his identity, to create his, um, uh, his view of himself as a person, as an enlightened person who brings enlightenment to, to all the countries that he conquers. Uh, that's, of course, very contradictory to do that with violence and to, 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 um, to fight any o opposition, but then say, finally, well, finally, it's for your own good. But that's what often happened, happened in history. Napoleon took objects away from every area where, uh, uh, which he conquered, from Rome, uh, a lot of other Italian cities, but from Egypt, he brought in an enormous collection uh, that is only partly in the Louvre because most of the collection was again taken when he was defeated by the English and brought to London. So you see, it's a history of taking things from each other uh, with violence that's clearly robbery, but also in other ways, in, in very, very um, more subtle political ways. Uh, some of the officers in the French army, for instance, claimed that these objects were not owned by the French state, but they were private property and that therefore the English didn't have the right to confiscate them. Well, all these complicated issues are things we address. Napoleon himself also has an enormous agency. There are, I don't know how many books written about him, but when you are confronting his own clothes, uh, they are in the collection of the Chateau of Fontainebleau, you clearly feel that agency of that powerful man, whether you agree with him or not, to see the original gray coat and to see the original cap, uh, the hat that he uh, wore, is quite a thing. And uh, it is a place where you see a lot of people stopping, taking photographs. Wow, an experience. That's the, 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 the agency, the impressive agency that cannot be taken in words. So this is the agency of Napoleon. You can't cl get closer to Napoleon than this. So there I am very close to contested heritage. Um, Napoleon took things away from Italy, for instance, and these Italian things were m mostly brought back to Italy after Napoleon was uh, defeated, but the Egyptian things were not brought back. And uh, contested heritage is particularly important in the context of... Uh, violent colonial wars. This is a picture of the Dutch colonial army where they conquered Lombok, the island of Lombok, east of Java. And you see uh, uh, officers of the army posing before the destroyed palace of the king of Lombok. And this is one of the jewels, one of the brushes uh, in gold and uh, diamond um, that they took from that site, from the burned remains of that palace. I go shortly back to Singasari, um, where some statues, sorry, some statues were found, uh, and this, for instance, is one of the most top pieces from uh, the Buddhist art. It was found close to the temple of Singasari, not in the temple, but uh, a few kilometers away. The Buddhist goddess of Pratyaparamita, and to show you that uh, the discussion about returning things is absolutely not new, this statue was returned to Indonesia in 1978 because the Indonesians already in 1949, during the independence uh, negotiations, demanded some of their cultural heritage back. And it took them 30 years, nearly 30 years, to get this top piece uh, back to Indonesia. It's now uh, shown in the National Museum in uh, Jakarta, but it did not go back to Singasari. So there is a discussion there. Why is it in the National Museum, claimed by the nation state, 
and it did not go to Malang or to the museum in Surabaya, close to the site of Singasari. A final example of um, uh, contested heritage is, of course, the monuments that uh, are nowadays related uh, uh, to slavery. Uh, and I hope I can get this working. I'm not quite sure. how I can start this. Maybe someone can give me advice. Sorry? Tens of thousands of people took part in further anti-racism protests across Britain today, with the statue of a 17th century slave trader pulled The image down doesn't show. Crystal, well. No. Okay, then, uh, well, the, the photograph says a lot already in... Uh, uh, June last uh, this year, uh, uh, you know, it was more or less the, the intensification of Black Lives Matter uh, related to the death of uh, uh, George Floyd. And in that context, in the, the English, uh, the UK city of Bristol, the statue of Edward Coulson, a very prominent statue in the center of Bristol, was taken off and thrown in the water uh, because Coulson, he was there because he did a lot for the city of Bristol. Uh, he started hospitals, he did a lot on social care, but he was also intensively related to the slave trade in the 17th century. So that's where uh, his statue, why his statue was taken off and thrown into the water. It was a very emotional, uh, it was a very emotional event, but it shows what kind of an agency monuments and statues can have. That is heritage, uh, contested or not, and that's what we're going to talk about in the MA Heritage and Society. Thank you very much. I um, think it's now time to look at uh, some of the questions that you uh, may have sent in, uh, and I will give a sign or somehow I will see what kind of questions you have, hopefully. Okay, we'll, we will find a solution. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so this is Marie Sorisi. I'm going to read the questions. And the first question is, will lecturers and professors teach about their own projects in seminars, for example, would you like to answer, please? Um, yes, uh, there are, of course, uh, courses with a certain program and some literature that you have to read, but we will certainly use our, our own work as examples. Uh, one of the reasons is that, that, it, is, that it is recent work. Uh, from literature, you often get uh, more older work, but we are in the middle of the field, so we, uh, we certainly use uh, our own work as examples and to make you part of that research. I'm sure it's the same for Marie. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Leiden University is a research-driven university. So we, we start from our research to do our teaching. So we share in the teaching that we do, we talk about our research. We take taste cases from our research. So I expect to hear about our research. It is, at the, it is the foundation of our teaching. The second question by Anna Marie is, I wonder how choosing the specific field school works. For example, if I would prefer joining the field work in the nearest, is it probable that I will be chosen? You will have to apply. Leiden students are, have the priority over students from outside. 
And usually it's a very short application where you have to say in a few words why you want to go to that site. And most of the time, um, the students do find a spot in their preferred uh, fieldwork because we do our best to accommodate students with their wishes. So I would expect that, yes, indeed, Anna-Marie, you would be able to join the fieldwork in the Near East because people are going to do their best to give you a spot over there once you have uh, put on paper why you want to go there. And a third question. I am interested in Neanderthals and human origins. Could you please explain a bit more about your research? And this question is for me, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so yes, of course, I'm very happy to talk more about my research. I, um, one of the uh, focus of my uh, research currently is about figuring out the amount and the frequency of interactions between late Neanderthals and first modern humans in Europe. Because we now all know that Neanderthals and modern humans interbred. However, what, how, did it, how did that happen? Was it love or war? We have no idea. And how frequent were those interactions? We also don't know. So this is what I am, I am working on currently with a small group. Uh, we received uh, a nice uh, funding from the Dutch National Research Agency to do this research. And in the coming five years, I expect that we will clarify what was the nature of the interactions between the late Neanderthals and the first modern humans and how frequent those interactions were. I believe it's extremely important because this tells us about our uh, remote uh, ancestors, whom I hope I've shown you with a few examples today, still have impact on who we are today, who we are biologically speaking, but also, um, uh, funny enough, <laughs> what kind of tools we are using. So human evolution is a very long history, and my uh, research is about that very deep history. Okay, a question for you, Peter. Oh dear. Will the heritage courses focus on specific geographic areas? And uh, how are heritage courses being studied in the MA program? Um, well, let's first talk about the ge geographical specialization, the geographical um, uh, focus of the program. Uh, actually, there are, there are, there are more ge ge geographical issues. Uh, I am myself more specialized in so Southeast Asia, New Guinea, and my later work was in North Africa. That's why I'm involved in the pro project in Tunisia. The, uh, uh, one of my colleagues is uh, particularly uh, involved in Central and South American studies. He comes from the Museum of Ethnology in Leiden, where he was the curator for Central and South American studies. Uh, so there are actually examples from many different areas, but the main focus will be uh, Central and South America, uh, North Africa, Indonesia, and Europe. And there is, we're going to take one last question because we have one minute left. And this question is, will the MA uh, courses involved practicals and or museum visits? So what about the museum visits, uh, Peter? Yeah, well, there, there will certainly be uh, m museum visits uh, with, uh, with us, with uh, the teachers. And there is the obligation to do uh, f at least 15 days of work in a museum in the form of an internship. Uh, and uh, that's usually one of the, uh, a very successful part of the program. And it's also interesting to do that here because Leiden is really a city with a lot of museums and a lot of heritage, uh, a lot of important co collections. And when it comes to practicals, yes, indeed, uh, we have our teaching is very much hands on. We have beautiful lab settings in Leiden where we do practicals where we look at stone tools, ceramic, bone tools, human remains, 
um, all sorts of artifacts and objects coming from the deep past and also the more recent past. I think this is the last... Ah, no, oh. we still have five minutes oh. to, to go. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so we still have time, actually. Um, do we have any other questions that we may want to take? I'm, I may also add to uh, the things that we said already that it is uh, it's quite interesting, I think, to be in Leiden uh, the next few years, the next two years, because do keep in mind that Leiden will be European City of Science in 2022. So there will be an enormous uh, active, a load of activities in 2022. We will invite all kinds of international experts. So even if, uh, well, let's say if there is an, uh, an interesting subject or a very a subject that we really have to address and we don't have the knowledge ourselves, we will just invite these people. And I have already a list of people that we want to invite. I cannot share that with you now. But 2022 will really be uh, a very active year. Uh, science, both social sciences, archaeology, heritage studies, exact sciences, the whole spectrum that we can find here in Leiden and partly also outside of Leiden will be um, uh, on display in the shape of seminars, discussion meetings, performances in 2022. Okay. Okay, that, that was it. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, uh, we, we get a signal that we have to stop now. So uh, I thank you all for joining us and I'm sure I do it also on behalf of Marie. Yes. Uh, see you in Leiden. Thank you very much. See you soon, we hope.